Good morning. Please stand as you are able and join me to the call to worship. A righteous branch has sprung forth to bring goodness and peace to our world. Our promise of salvation is at hand. A righteous branch has sprung forth to bring hope to our world. Our eyes have been held with the goodness and mercy of the Lord. A son has been given to us bringing justice and virtue to the earth. Our hearts have felt the stirrings of God's presence. The spirit of truth is here to teach us the ways of God. Let us worship the God of our salvation.
to you in peace in the name of God, our Creator, and Christ, our Redeemer. We greet you whether you're here with us live in the nave, whether you're watching on the live stream now or sometime in the future, or whether you're listening on the radio or through your phone. We are really glad that you are here on this, the first Sunday in Advent. Can you believe that we are already here? Today, preaching for us, we have the Reverend Pat DuPont. Some know that Pat has been serving since July as our director of the Outreach Center. Pat is, an, uh, is a commissioned deacon in the Methodist Church. In the Methodist Church, there are two different tracks for ordination. There are the deacons who are trying to connect the church with the world, and there are the elders who are trying to order the church as together. We are grateful to have Pat with us, joining us, preaching us with us for today as he's been doing such amazing work for the church over the course of the last six months. Let us now, without touching, greet one another with signs of peace. The peace of Christ be with you. Please be seated. One of the new realities that has come about in the last year and a half is that we are a congregation that is not and is no longer limited to this particular place. As we worship together right now, there are those who are worshiping with us around the country for sure and maybe even around the globe this morning. And we recognize that there are those in Rochester who have not yet made their way back into the congregation, and we honor them as they are trying to find their way as well. And so during this Advent season, to remember that as we sit in these pews, we are not the only people worshiping. We will have the Advent candle lighting at least done mixed virtually and in person. And so we start by having Ashley and Steve Danu share with us the Advent candle lighting for the first Advent candle. I'd invite you to turn your attention to the screens. We light this candle as a symbol of the hope we have in the promise of the Christ's coming. For the Lord will fulfill the promise to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. May the light sent from God shine in the darkness to show us God's way. Let, Let there, there be, be light. light. Today's scripture lesson 
is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 21, verses 25 through 36. There will be signs of the sun, the moon, and the stars, and on the earth distress among nations confused by the roaring of the sea and the waves. People will faint from fear and foreboding of what is coming upon the world. For powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man is in a cl- coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now, when these things become to take place, stand up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Then he told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they sprout leaves, you can see for yourself and know that summer is already near. So, also, when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Be on guard so that your heart are not weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of this life and that day does not catch you unexpectedly like a trap. For it will come upon all who live on the face of the whole earth. Be alert at all times, praying that you have the strength to escape all these things that will take place and to stand before the Son of Man. The word of God for the people of God.
Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, and he loves each and every one of you too. At this time, I invite the children forward for children's time, and I want the families to know that children are welcome to worship with you or come to an enrichment with Miss Holly and myself. Come on down, kids. It is so good to see you all this morning. Today, I want to start by using our senses. The first one I want to use is our scent of sight, our eyes. Look around. What is different? What has changed in church in just one week? Yes, Hannah. There's beautiful Christmas trees. What else, Elliot? Lots of Christmas. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas, wouldn't you say? Okay, now our next one. We're going to use our sense of smell. We're going to use our nose, and I'm going to help enhance it because it's not that strong. <laughs> what do you smell? Uh, nothing. Nothing. <laughs> oh, do I need to get a little closer to you? <laughs> What? It's, it's pine, the smell of the trees. Doesn't it smell like Christmas? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the next one. We're going to use our ears. What do you hear? That, Duane is doing that with the organ. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that just the magic? I hear magic, I hear the Christ star when I hear that beautiful triangle music. Well, today is the first Sunday of Advent. And did I find out something neat? The word Advent comes from a Latin word meaning coming. We're waiting for the coming of Christ. And another word, we're waiting for this light. They refer to it as the light coming into a world that can be rather dark, physically dark. You know how dark it gets so early at night? Sometimes you're coming home from school and it's dark out. But also the world can be just dark, sad. A lot of people feel lonely and they feel darkness. We are called to be the light. Today, a family lit a candle for us and that's the first candle of Advent. We light one every Sunday, and this candle is the candle of hope. What do you hope for? Does anybody hope for anything? Yes, Jonah, what do you hope for? I think your sister's going to help you. Lydia, what does he want to say? You like the smelling of the pine? <laughs> does anybody else hope for something? Yes, Louisa, what do you hope for? Unicorns. Well, that is a great imagination. I love that too. All right. All right, who else wants to share? All right, let's see here. On, Pi. I hope for my dog. You're hopeful for your dog. So, in the spirit of hope, I'll get to you guys in a little bit. Let us all think of this next week to be what can we be hopeful for? Lots of things to be hopeful for and lots to present, and we need to use all of our senses, our eyes, our ears, our sense of smell and taste to help us prepare for the coming of Jesus, for Christmas, for this magic that the season is all about. 
Can we get ready to pray, and then we'll end with the Lord's Prayer. Dear God, thank you for these children. Thank you for this season of waiting, anticipation, and preparing our hearts in all of our senses for the miracle of the Christ child that brings light into a world that can be rather dark. Help us, each and every one of us, to be that light for others. And as Jesus taught his disciples to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us pray. God, help us hear what it is that you are saying to us here today. Help us to move in the direction that you would have us move. May your gospel be preached by all of our words and lives. Amen. Happy New Year. While the world around, around us, outside this place, is still about a month away from its New Year's celebration, here in the church, today is the first Sunday of Advent, which means that today is the first day of a new liturgical year. And maybe it's slightly odd that Advent marks the beginning of our church calendar, this arrival at a new year, because Advent in and of itself is all about where we are going but aren't yet. It's all about what will be but isn't yet. It's all about hope and expectation and waiting. The hope and expectation and waiting that preceded the birth of Christ 2,000 years ago, the hope and expectation and waiting that we are experiencing today as we look forward to our celebration of Christmas that commemorates that birth, and the hope and expectation and waiting that we experience as we look even further forward to the promised second coming of Christ. And that last bit, 
Christ's second coming is what our scripture reading this morning is all about. And it's a reading that is a little bit alarming. It's not exactly the warm holiday season, can't wait for Christmas kind of text that perhaps we're hoping for on the first Sunday of the Advent season. As you're driving into church this morning through the idyllic snowfall and seeing scouts selling Christmas trees, this probably isn't what you were hoping for. Instead of promises of a beautiful baby, stories of miraculous pregnancies, of angels and shepherds, of a silent night, of peace on earth and goodwill, we're confronted with signs in the sky, distress among the nations, the roaring of the oceans, people fainting from fear and foreboding, the powers of the heavens being shaken. We're confronted with storms and chaos. Storms and chaos, we're told, that accompany the coming of the Son of Man descending on a cloud. What we get in our scripture reading on this first Sunday of Advent, this first Sunday of a new year, is a scripture about the end of the world. It is literally an apocalyptic text. And I imagine that that strikes us here this morning as at least a little bit strange, if not uncomfortable or unsettling. Because it's possible that texts like this one draw up images and associations in our minds of end-time depictions of rapture and damnation, of judgment day, of the destruction of the earth, while a fortunate few who have been deemed worthy escape to the paradise of some otherworldly, heavenly place. Or maybe texts like this one remind us of Christian traditions with which we're less familiar, that focus a great deal of their preaching and teaching around the end times and around the the necessity of repentance the urgency of repentance. And perhaps those kind of associations lead us to sort of write off or avoid texts like this one altogether. Perhaps the simple fact that we don't really understand or particularly like what we're hearing here leads us to avoid texts like this one. Because the pictures that they paint don't seem to make any sense at all with the God that we worship here at Asbury First. They don't seem to make any sense at all with the depiction of Christ that we latch onto from other places in the Gospels. Maybe we don't really know what we believe about the end times, but we know for sure that we don't worship a punitive, vengeful, capital punishment enforcing God. So we don't really know what to do with passages like this one. And maybe we're tempted to just sort of flip past them, to get to something a little bit more familiar, something a little bit more comfortable, something a little bit easier to digest. But here we are on the first Sunday of Advent, on the first Sunday of a new liturgical year, and the lectionary, the collection of assigned readings for this year, confronts us with the storms and chaos that accompany the apocalypse. Our tradition makes sure that not only do we not skip past this uncomfortable section of the Bible, but that it's the foundation upon which the entire next liturgical year is laid. This is where it all begins. So it must be important. So we had better figure out what we're going to do with it. First of all, I think it's worth noting that despite what Hollywood and the Left Behind franchise of books and movies might have us believe, this is not a text about the destruction and damnation of the earth. This is not a text about the departure of God and the faithful to some far-off, otherworldly, heavenly place. None of that is actually present in the scripture. On the contrary, this is a text about the full and final realization of the kingdom of heaven right here on earth. This is not a story that is primarily about death and destruction. It's a story that is primarily about new life and completed construction. It's a story about the world being transformed into something new and holy. The first coming of Christ at Christmas, as told in the Gospel of Luke, brings with it a message of peace on earth and goodwill to all. The second coming of Christ, depicted here today also from the Gospel of Luke, is no different. It's part of the same story and it carries with it the same message. Jesus came to earth the first time and he announced that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. He announced that heaven was breaking into our world. And he described the kingdom of heaven as a place where hungry people are fed, where homeless people are sheltered, where sick people are made well, where imprisoned people are set free, where sinners are forgiven. And Jesus himself was the embodiment of this kingdom of heaven. He carried it with him wherever he went. He established its presence here on earth. He invited his disciples to join him in the work of building it and spreading it. And throughout his ministry, he welcomed more and more people into it, into this alternative way of living and being right here in the midst of the broken world around us. 
The text that we read today is about the work that Jesus initiated then being made complete. It's about the kingdom of heaven permeating its way into every corner of the earth. It's about the light of Christ reaching into every shadow. It's about the heaven that Christ carried with him and shared with every hurting person that he encountered during his earthly ministry being brought to fruition all around us. So already this is sounding a little bit better, right? That sounds like something we can get behind, this full realization of the kingdom of heaven on earth, an end to suffering, every tear being wiped away, no more mourning or crying or pain. That sounds like the kind of future that we can hope for and long for during this Advent season. Except that the scripture reading still sounds pretty ominous. If the second coming of Christ carries with it the same message as the first, peace on earth, goodwill to all, good news to the poor, freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight to the blind, liberation for the oppressed, then why is it accompanied by storms and chaos? Why are people fainting from fear rather than singing and rejoicing? The truth is that even after we reframe this text as being about the full realization of heaven on earth, even after leaving behind any unfortunate, destructive, violent associations that we might have, this text is still scary. It's still scary because the coming of the kingdom of heaven, while good news, will strike a lot of the world as very bad news. Because the kingdom of heaven represents a complete upheaval of the world as we know it. Even if we are 100% cognitively in support of the new world that God is building where injustice and oppression and suffering are no more, the truth is it is still going to be terrifying and hard for many of us to let go of the imperfect world that we live in now. We might not like to admit it, but many of us are comfortable in the world as it exists now. And if we are going to live in the kingdom of heaven, we are going to have to live differently. The kingdom of heaven that Jesus preaches about and teaches about and embodies exists in direct opposition to so much of the way that the world around us currently operates. Poverty and oppression are no more. Suffering is no more. Everyone has a place to live. Everyone has food to eat. Everyone has a voice and is listened to. Everyone receives the health care that they need. Resources are shared completely. For that world to become a reality, everything will change. Everything has to change in a dramatic way. To quote the prophet Isaiah, valleys will be lifted up and mountains made low. To quote the Virgin Mary, the powerless will be lifted up and the powerful will be brought down from their thrones. For poverty to be eradicated, wealth has to be shared. For the powerless to be empowered, power has to be shed. For God to truly and fully reign on earth, we can't. For the kingdom of heaven to truly and fully reign on earth, the kingdoms of the world can't. Money can't. Security can't. Savvy business practices can't. Conventional wisdom can't. Efficiency can't. Pragmatism can't. Comfort can't. Our opinions can't. And perhaps in sitting with that and thinking through that, it's tempting to point the finger away from ourselves at someone else, somewhere else, who we view as needing most to embrace that kind of change. Perhaps we want to point the finger at our government or our elected officials or community leaders or whoever we can identify as someone who misuses or abuses their power or who clearly works in opposition to what is right and what is just. But the need for dramatic change doesn't only exist in some abstract, far-off, systemic place. It isn't a reformation that happens divorced from our everyday lives. We are talking about change that has real consequences for the ways that all of us live. Christ said, the kingdom of heaven is within you. Our habits will have to change. Our routines will have to change. We will have to open ourselves up to transformation. And that will cause many to hesitate. That kind of change will instill fear. That kind of change will inevitably expose conflict People will inevitably be offended and will be resistant to such a dramatic reordering of their lives and their world. People will inevitably be resistant to letting go of so much of what we know and trust about the world as it currently exists around us. And that is what is at the heart of the storms and fear in this scripture. They're not the result of some divine show of force at the end times. They are the earthly resistance to and conflict generated by the kind of radical change that is inherently built into the coming of the kingdom of heaven on earth. 
They are the clashing of the ways of the world, the ways of all of our lives, with the way of God. And perhaps that's challenging. Perhaps it's hard to wrap our heads around the idea that the coming of heaven on earth, the coming of peace on earth, the coming of the good news of the gospel would actually generate conflict and fear. But it shouldn't really come as a surprise to us. It shouldn't exactly surprise us that if we follow the way of Jesus, if we seek to participate in God's work of building the kingdom of heaven on earth, if we attempt, as Peter Morin put it, to build a new world within the shell of the old, that there will be conflict. Jesus told us that it would happen. The same Jesus who said that he had come to bring good news to the poor and announced that the kingdom of heaven was breaking into our world also said things like, if the world hates you, keep in mind, it hated me first. My kingdom is not of this world. You can't serve two masters. If you want to follow me, you will take up your cross. To save your life, you must lose it. Drop everything you have. Let go of everything you know and follow me. Blessed are you when you are persecuted because of me. The gospel of Jesus Christ is challenging. It's disorienting. Those who live in the kingdom of heaven are in this world, but not of this world. We exist differently. We live our lives in ways that are sometimes in direct opposition to the norms adhered to by the rest of society. The kingdom of heaven is a new and better reality that challenges the current dominant reality. And so the full coming of heaven, as is made evident in today's scripture, may be accompanied by storms. Storms that shake the very foundations of the world that we know and love. And so maybe this morning, if we're honest, we're feeling a little bit ambivalent. Maybe we are torn because we truly and genuinely hope and long for the kingdom of heaven on earth. We want so desperately for suffering to end. We want so desperately for poverty and violence to be no more. But if we're honest, perhaps we're also a little bit nervous. Because such dramatic change is scary. Conflict is scary. The storms are scary. Perhaps we don't want to think about the things, the comforts, the privileges, the opinions, the perspectives that we might have to give up. Perhaps we don't want to think about the people and the institutions and the systems with whom we might need to come into conflict if we're going to live fully in God's kingdom if we are all in on following Christ. But maybe it will help us to push past that ambivalence. Maybe it will help us to push through our fear if we recognize that the storms and chaos are not new. They don't just suddenly appear someday in the future at the second coming of Christ as the kingdom of heaven is fully realized. The truth is that these storms are already raging all around us. The kingdom of heaven and the kingdoms of this world are already clashing. There is already conflict. There is already resistance to divine justice. The members of our community who are directly impacted by injustice know that. Those who are the victims of poverty and oppression know that people are already fainting from fear and foreboding. They know that the nations are already in distress. They know that there is suffering and chaos all around us in the world already. The coming of the kingdom of heaven doesn't initiate these storms. In fact, Luke tells us in chapter 8, in this same gospel, in a different story, that Jesus is actually in the business of calming storms. The coming of the kingdom of heaven pulls back the curtain on the storms that already exist. It pulls back the curtain on the fear and suffering and conflict that already exist, and in doing so, forces them to be acknowledged, forces them to come to a head, forces us to choose between living in God's world or living in our own worlds. And it illuminates a future beyond the storms, a future without them. And that future, that escape from the storms that already exist and wreak havoc on earth and ruin the lives of real people who live in this city, that future is what we are waiting for during Advent. That is the long view that we take during this quiet season of hope and expectation and waiting. But we don't just wait. We don't just wait for the kingdom to come someday far off in the future because the kingdom is already breaking in and we seek to live in it now. At the beginning of the scripture reading from today, Jesus casts this end times vision, but at the end of the reading, he pivots and he gives concrete advice saying, therefore, live in this way now. 
As disciples of Jesus Christ, God's promised future affects how we live today. As followers of Jesus Christ, we are called to be citizens of the kingdom of heaven, to live under God's reign and to participate in its breaking in. We're called to live our individual lives and our life together in ways that further the coming of the kingdom of heaven here on earth. We are to come alongside Christ in carving out space in this world for the kingdom of heaven to push its way further in. We're to come alongside Christ in carving out space in this world for the kingdom of heaven to take root and become more and more established. So what does that look like? If the kingdom of heaven is a place where anyone who is hungry is fed, anyone who is naked is clothed, anyone who is sick is made well, anyone who is lonely is visited, anyone who is homeless is sheltered, anyone who sins is forgiven, then we are to create spaces where that is the reality. Perhaps that is what the church is in its simplest form, an outpost of the kingdom of heaven, heaven's embassy on earth. And perhaps that's what we as Christian disciples are striving to be, citizens of that kingdom and emissaries to the world. This is what our new outreach center is intended to be, a place where all are welcomed, where all are cared for, where poverty is alleviated and ultimately destroyed a place where we live so fully into the kingdom of heaven that it exposes and challenges some of these storms that are already raging around us in Rochester, a place where the kingdom of heaven becomes so fully realized that the status quo of racism and violence and poverty is threatened. Our outreach center, our entire church, Asbury First, is to be a place where we care so deeply for each other and work so fervently in our pursuit of real divine justice that it might even be a little scary. If the kingdom of heaven really takes root at 1010 East Avenue and at 1040 East Avenue and at 1050 East Avenue, then we all will probably end up feeling the same way we did when we heard this morning's scripture reading for the first time, a bit uncomfortable and a bit unsettled. The more that we uncover and witness and experience and live into the kingdom of heaven, the more visible the storms that rage around us are going to become. But at the same time, the more that we uncover and witness and experience and live into the kingdom of heaven, the more we realize how desperately our world needs to be consumed by it. How desperately the storms need to be addressed so that they can be calmed. Our outreach center at 1010 East Avenue won't be open until sometime around this same time next year, but our outreach ministries are active. While we don't have access to our physical building next door, we are still operating as outposts of the kingdom of heaven. We're still participating in its breaking in, and I would invite you to join us in this work. I would invite you to serve, to build relationships and community, to live among the poor in the kingdom of heaven, to join in on the long journey of loosening our grip on the world as it currently exists in order to more fully enter into the new world that God is building right here in our midst. I would invite you to engage in ministries of hospitality and compassion and justice in our city because I think that in doing so, our hearts will gradually become more and more prepared to meet the coming of the kingdom of heaven with rejoicing rather than fear. Sometimes it is in doing and experiencing that we come to believe. Sometimes it's through action that we can begin to hope. This is what Advent is about. Taking time where we are to remember where it is that we're, that we're going and being reminded that it's good news. It's about acknowledging and confessing that we may find the fullness of the kingdom of heaven frightening and challenging. Acknowledging that such dramatic change in our world and in our individual lives is scary. It's about taking a moment to recognize that the incarnation of God at Christmas, the establishment of heaven on earth in the person of Jesus Christ, changes everything for all time. And it's about learning to genuinely long for and live into God's reign on earth, trusting that we will weather the storms. This Advent season, let us find courage in hope, peace, joy, and love. Let us recommit ourselves to living in the kingdom of heaven here on earth. Let us recommit ourselves to coming alongside Christ in the work of building and spreading it. Let us recommit ourselves to inviting God's dramatic change into our lives and becoming agents of that dramatic change in the world through ministries of hospitality, compassion, and justice. Let us commit ourselves to facing the storms, trusting in the one who calms them. Thanks be to God.
join your hearts with mine in prayer. God of life and light, we give you thanks today for the beginning of Advent. This season is a blessed reminder of your ever-present and future kingdom of heaven. We, pro- we pause in prayer aware of this kingdom that is present in our midst. This kingdom has been planted by you as a seed in our own hearts. Our deepest desire is to nurture this kingdom of heaven, even as it challenges our past, so that it might become our future reality. We pray for the places in our lives and in our world in which your kingdom has not yet been fully realized, for people who are still hungry, who still do not have a place to call home, who are still facing victimization, still facing violence, for families who have lost children, who struggle to bear children, and for children whose families are not loving, for those living with anxiety and depression, for those who are angry, and for any who are ill or in pain from disease or injury, we pray. During this season, we often experience heightened emotions, and we pray for your wisdom to navigate the terrain of the holidays. Help us to walk with your grace, to prioritize our time to align with your mission of love, to choose to respond rather than to react. O God, each day we have an opportunity to grow closer to you and closer to each other. And we pray for your spirit to nudge us and comfort us on this path. God of life and love, help us each day to choose your light. And let there be light. Amen. If you are visiting with us this morning, whether in person or on the live stream, we just want to take a moment to say we're really glad that you're here. Asbury First is not a perfect place, but we recognize that we are more perfect with you than we are without you. And we invite you to join us in our mission to love God and neighbor, to live fully, to serve all, and repeat. We recognize that in this moment that we have 511 views from two, three different countries and 22 states. And so we say hello to those who are watching us right now, yes, in the United States, but also in Canada and in Singapore, to those who are watching from New York and Florida, Pennsylvania, Virginia, Kansas, hi, mom and dad, Michigan, Massachusetts, Tennessee, Texas, California, Colorado, Ohio, New Jersey, North Carolina, Quebec, Nebraska, Maryland, South Carolina, Oklahoma, Indiana, and Wyoming. What a gift it is to know that as we gather here, we are not the only ones who are here. Now, next week, immediately following the service, that is on December 5th, we will have a very brief uh, church conference, and it is to vote on one item related to the Boy Scouts of America bankruptcy filing most Methodist churches across the country who have uh, sponsored Boy Scouts are having to do this, and so we'll have a very, very brief meeting following the service. It will be an official church conference as dictated by the conference to us. So for those who are able to stay, members immediately following the service next week, we'll have a very brief meeting for one item and then move on from there. I hope that you'll... uh, planned to attend the Annie celebration as uh, the musical has been rescheduled due to COVID that had come up during the last time. And so we are praying for a safe and healthy Annie, and we will do everything to keep Annie and all of those others safe within the production. Uh, We have the Hanging of the Greens coming up on this Wednesday, so if you're looking for a way that you might come and participate in helping to make the church a little more festive during this time, I would invite you to join us for that. Two other items. One, if you heard the sermon today, the excellent sermon today, and thought to yourself, I wonder how I might take that next step, how I might get involved, 
or if you're thinking it's a little overwhelming for me to do it, you don't have to go through it alone. Part of what the new class meetings are, those discipleship groups, those small groups, they're there to help support one another as we try and figure out faith, as we try to figure out what it means to live as disciples of Jesus Christ. So if you've been wondering about how you might get involved, how you might take that next step, how you, you might think about this, I'd invite you to consider joining one of those small groups. We'll have another batch starting up right in the new year. And so if you've been thinking about that, I'd invite you to come and speak with one of us. We'd be happy to help you. Certainly, Reverend DuPont would be happy to help answer any questions that you might have because it would be a good opportunity to remind yourself that you don't have to do it alone. And finally, those of you who uh, received emails or who receive email from us will have known that we have made the announcement. We also sent it home for those who uh, need it that way, that we are going to be having services on Christmas Eve at noon, at 5, at 7, and at 11. We will also have a pageant at 3 o'clock, but we're asking that that remain live stream except for those families of those who are participating within the pageant. Starting next week on December 5th, we will send out an email for those who would like to register for the attendance for those. We will limit it to 250 so that we can keep ourselves safe during this time. For those who don't have email, we'll have a form here. We'll also have phone calls available. We're reserving not just for those online, but also for those who may come, who are, we hope, from the community, who are finding a new church and are looking for a place to be. And for those who uh, don't have access to email and are doing these things virtually, we are also saving seats for those who need to call in and register via phone. You'll receive an email next Sunday that will begin that process of registering for these. We have done everything in our power during this COVID moment to avoid registration, but we also recognize that in order for us to be open to all and to be safe during this time, that we need to do it for this, for this season. We added another evening service because we recognized after our survey that that is the service that most people would like to attend. We're going to do everything in our power to make it possible for everybody who wants to be here to be here safely so that we can worship and remember the birth of the Christ child and maybe take another step closer to that kingdom of heaven. If you are in a place where you're able to give something to help support the ongoing ministries of this church, you're invited to do so either by texting the amount to 206-222-1050 or by placing something in the offering plates on your way out of the sanctuary. We turn now to our offertory anthem.
Blessed one, may our love for others increase even as you enrich the gifts you have given us. Send our gifts into the world as signs of the bounty of Christ entering our world. Amen. As you leave this place, go out and live as citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Go out and participate in its breaking in through ministries of hospitality, compassion, and justice. Go out motivated by Advent hope to face the storms so that they may one day be calmed. Go in peace.